to say, this is the third, uh, third lecture in this series of three. Welcome to the Whit uh, Whitney and Betty McMillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. And I am, I'm directed to say this, I am, I'm a Sterling Professor of Political Science here at Yale, now Emeritus. And I am pleased to introduce Eric Harris Nelson for the third and final of his three sets of lectures, the series being entitled Exigencies or Exigencies. I looked it up, I didn't know how to pronounce it. It turns out it can go either way. <laughs> exigencies or exigencies. <laughs> either way, go either way. Exigencies from impermanent emergencies to enduring expectations. As I am pleased to introduce Ira, let me imply that I'm more than pleased, I'm delighted to introduce Ira. We go way back many decades, although I still consider him something of a youngster. I don't know. <laughs> you could stop now. I'm such a happy family. <laughs> <laughs> and we've shared for a long time, particularly in recent times, an interest in congressional history, personal bond. And lately, Ira has been blown into a leading buff and expert on the topic of Congressional history. I would say if you look at his own career, he's gravitated toward more of an emphasis of that topic. He's, uh, his re recent two books which are, that are relevant to that cause are, this is about six years ago, Fear, which you may have read, maybe you did, Fear, The New Deal, and the Origins of Our Time. That's been out there. But there's a new book out, uh, out just off, hot off the presses in 2018 called Southern Nation. And it's about the, the place of the South and national policy making in the many decades after the Civil War. Wonderful book. There's a plug. You should, you should know about the Southern Nation book as well as the, the uh, Fear book and uh, read both of them. They haven't already done that. That's what I'd say. Actually, the Southern Nation book is jointly or quickly authored. I should say that with David Bateman and John, John Levinsky. But to put in that plug for him and for that specialty is to suggest Ira's versatility and his range during his career. He's all over the place in these topics and emphases and maybe they're very broad that he has mastered and uh, contributed so much to. I mean, his topic at, the, at this series is different from congressional. It's, it's different and it's new and it could hardly be more important that his emergencies, exigencies, and his third lecture will be in, is entitled uh, Negotiating the Rule of Law. Negotiating the Rule of Law. It is. Um, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to do. So, I, I'm going to, what we've just done in this room is confirm um, the only hypothesis in the social sciences always to be confirmed. It's Tom Schelling, a great student of game theory and the like, um, says that when people come to a lecture and there are um, uh, more seats than people, then it's individually rational for people to sit to the rear. Um, but if, if people follow their individual level rationality, collectively you have a suboptimal outcome. So uh, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to ask people in the back to come forward. How's that? If I may, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. That way we have a more intimate occasion. We need, we need another shelling hypothesis about how much forward people will come, but never. <laughs> Oh, and now we're making room for some more people coming in. Good. Oh, a lot of people coming. Very good idea. That was a, 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 a very big group just came walked in. Missed your introduction. I don't know where they've all come from. <laughs> so. This is cinematic, you understand. <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> the, uh, anyway, um, those who've just come in have missed the most gracious of introductions by my dear friend and colleague, David Mayhew. Um, you forgot to do one thing. You said, 
I am Sterling Professor Emeritus, but you didn't say I'm David Mayhew, but everyone at Yale knows that. <laughs> but everyone knows that, dear David. Um, it's a really a, a, more than a treat, a very special honor to be introduced by Professor uh, Mayhew, who's, um, uh, without whose example, um, uh, those of us who care and think about American politics would be um, much weaker um, in our uh, instruments and capacities uh, to know how to enter into uh, complicated topics, um, and especially anyone daring to work on Congress um, is more indebted to Professor Mayhew than to um, literally anyone else. So thank you, dear David, for that introduction. The, con the contest between the good of protecting the country from danger and the good of remaining within the confines of ordinary, lawful political processes is not new. This field of tension has challenged leaders and citizens from the earliest moments of liberal government in the United States. Two decades after the ratification of the Constitution, on September 14, 1810, Thomas Jefferson was asked by John Colvin, Quote, are there not periods when, in free governments, it is necessary for officers in responsible stations to exercise an authority beyond the law? And was not the time of Aaron Burr's treason just such a period? Jefferson replied six days later, affirming that leaders have an obligation, and I quote, of saving our country when in danger, he swiftly added how, quote, overleaping the law often is a far greater evil than a strict adherence to its imperfect provisions. So overleaping the law is, can be a great evil. Given this inherent tension, Jefferson stipulated how in navigating the rule of law, and I quote, the line of discrimination between cases may be difficult. When Robert Dahl identified a class of situations in 1953, quote, for which the traditional democratic processes are rather unsuitable and for which traditional theories of democracy provide no rational answer, a citation some of you have heard me make now for the third time, finding that finding the line of discrimination between cases when Dahl wrote had become vastly more demanding. By then, a new and he surmised permanent national security state had been created after the first atomic bomb was detonated at New Mexico's test site zero on July 15, 1945, then put to use to end the war with Japan. Unlike the call by Franklin Roosevelt in 1933, to wage a war against the emergency with the prospect of a return to a functioning economy, the institutional sinews of an entirely new zone of public life were shaped by lawmaking. The period's landmark legislation included the Atomic Energy Act of 1946, the National Security Act of 1947, the Defense Reorganization Act of 1949, the National Security Act, um, another National Security Act of 1950, and on and on. Especially after the August 1949 Soviet bomb in Kazakhstan ended America's atomic monopoly and intensified a Cold War of indeterminate duration, suspicion grew, loyalties were investigated, surveillance advanced, secrecy expanded. But not without limits. As Michael Hogan's important history of the origins of the post-war national security state demonstrates, the unification of the armed forces, the organization of the Pentagon, the harnessing of science for weapons production, the mobilization of production and manpower, the growth of an intelligence community, and other unprecedented instruments of national security formed inside a crucible of democratic debate 
and legislative contestation. The result, Hogan argued, was a middle ground. The defense of liberty understood in terms of limiting the reach of the state and the defense of liberty understood in terms of enhancing state power vied and compromised. But it must be said, as Dahl rightly emphasized, that especially once the Korean War commenced and military spending accelerated, the second impulse advanced faster than the first. Power shifted to the enlarging zone of enduring exceptions. The tradition of civic authority that constrains government by law, protects individual freedom, secures private life in civil society, and prevents repressive search and seizure, among other rights, thus was placed under persistent pressure. The enemy without was fierce and dangerous. Engaging with that enemy placed enormous pressure on the country's liberal democracy, arguably imposing more pressure than any time since Southern secession. In 1949, Clinton Rossiter announced, as Dahl would four years later, quote, that there is much to fear in the atomic age, and our fear is the more naked because it touches on the unknown. Dahl's tone was measured, marked more by a descriptive sigh rather than dramatic remonstration. Three decades later, after the hydrogen bomb, after intercontinental missiles, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Vietnam War, the Pentagon Papers, revelations, and the manifest durability of secrecy, surveillance, and what Eisenhower had called the military-industrial complex, Dahl's voice transmuted to alarm. When delivering the Abrams lectures that I mentioned yesterday in 1984 at Syracuse, Dahl asked whether, and I quote, the institutions of contemporary democracy are adequate to cope satisfactorily with the enormous complexity of public matters, and his analysis shifted from raising a fundamental question to announcing a disturbing answer. His early 1950s nightmare, he said, had become fact. Dahl now observed how, quote, American policies concerning nuclear weapons had been made for the better part of 35 years without hardly a trace of the adversarial process, a central feature of any vibrant democracy. He took note of, and I quote, a tragic paradox. No decisions, he wrote, can be more fateful for Americans and for the world than decisions about nuclear weapons. Yet these decisions have largely escaped the ordinary constraints and control of the democratic process. And he continued in uncommonly sharp language, we have, un we have alienated control over our lives to others. That is, for practical purposes, we simply have lost control over crucial decisions and lose control over our lives. The more we, if you read this side by side with say his preface to democratic theory, there's rather a different tone here. The more we alienate authority rather than delegate it on terms that allow us to retain a meaningful degree of final control, the more we lose our freedom and the more hollow the democratic process becomes." End quote. Yesterday, I closed by posing the question I should like to deal with tonight. At which point do exceptions become a new norm and thus transform the character and balance of the political order from within. This challenge I put in the, yesterday in terms presented by Carl Schmitt, the most incisive and articulate analytical enemy of liberal democracy in the 20th century, to ask whether our country's enlarged zone of exceptions can be governed in ways that resemble what he called the commissarial pattern of dictatorship a form of exceptional rule geared to strengthen an existing liberal constitution as distinct from what he called sovereign dictatorship. That freestanding response to exigencies outside the rule of law 
had moved from the pages of his 1920s political thought to stunning reality in non-liberal regimes, especially the most radical, Stalin's USSR, Hitler's Third Reich, the latter, as you know, being the dictatorship Schmidt both admired and served. As an incisive and articulate friend of liberal democracy, Dahl effectively posed a similar question in the 1950s and 1980s, worried, and I quote, that control over nuclear decisions is emblematic of a larger issue. He asked whether, again, quote, we have reached an inherent limit on democracy, thus whether we have discovered a fundamental and inescapable defect. If so, he continued, are we rationally obliged no matter how much our deepest feelings may tug us away from the dismaying conclusion to commit ourselves to a non-democratic alternative, at least over some set of public policies, of which policies about nuclear weapons are perhaps only an extreme example. Dahl understood modern American democracy not to be a system of simple majority rule, or the preserve of a single elite making closed determinations inaccessible to popular influence, but a complex system with many rulers, a polyarchy. This American hybrid he distinguished from dictatorship, not because the United States is governed by the majority, but because minorities, he said, govern who vary in composition from issue area to issue area including, in his early work, national security. In America's system of endless bargaining, he argued in the preface to democratic theory, all the active and legitimate groups in the population can make themselves heard at some crucial stage in the process of decision. And it was now exactly that that he put in question. Posing Schmidt's question in Dahl's term, we might ask, whether it's possible to prevent the democratic process from becoming hollow by preserving a meaningful degree of final control regarding the security-centered arena of exceptions for its central political institutions and for the country's citizens who wish to be heard at a crucial stage in the process of decision. How, within the framework of polyarchy, might that be accomplished? Now, there is a view, an influential one, to the effect that such a quest, the one I should like to address in much of what remains of this lecture, is hopeless, even innocent. We are too late. That's the position taken in the prominent writings by the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, who poses a challenge to liberal democracy in a spirit of doubt and hostility at least as far-reaching for our time as Carl Schmitt's was for his. But as compared to Schmitt, Agamben has been far more suspicious of state power and far less nostalgic for a lost liberal moment. Agamben claims in a profound and irreversible inversion that the zone of exception has become so overwhelming it to be dominant divorced from any semblance of the rule of law. His 2003 Stato il Ecezione gained global attention when it appeared in English two years later as State of Exception, placing exception in what he called a no-man's land between law and political facts. This drumbeat of a book insists that liberal norms, practices, and legality have been surmounted by the primary zone of legal in illegality, what he calls legal Ill illegality, an immense site of exception in regimes that call themselves both democratic and liberal, a zone far larger and more central than that Dahl had identified. The liberal tradition on this view has been rendered helpless. Injecting Dahl's nightmare with steroids, Agamben conveyed the situation of citizens as having degenerated so significantly that their, our, circumstances resemble stateless persons.
Divisions between war and peace, between legal and political decisions, have disappeared. Liberal law itself, he argued, has become the problem, not the solution. There is no turning back to constitutionalism. The only remaining hope lies, he argued, with a utopian vision of post-liberal political play, a politics outside the constraints of formal institutions. Now, this is a nightmare more total and more terrifying than Dahl's. Agamben's dystopia insists that the exception, a foundationless location, a site of pure violence without limitation or inherent discipline, has become the immovable standard. And any effort to navigate the rule of law thus is hopelessly innocent. Arguing that differences distinguishing totalitarian, absolutist, and liberal regimes have become indeterminate and obsolete, his analysis returned readers to Rome, but not to its commissarial dictatorship that was discussed the other day. Instead, Agamben highlighted a more obscure, less familiar, less remarked on institutional site, the Iustatitum, an empty space that suspended the law to save the republic rather than concentrate the law with the fullness of powers as in the case of the Roman dictatorship. He also focused on the octoritas, a Roman institution that deprived public enemies of any legal standing, subjecting them outside the law to the prospect of death at any moment. This zone, not the Roman dictatorship, is where we find contemporary exceptions, Agamben wrote, quote, an empty space in which human action with no relation to law stands before a law with no relation to life, end quote. This dark formulation is consistent with earlier work in which he designated Auschwitz as paradigmatic of all of modernity, rather than seeing it as marking radical evil at the extreme end of a continuum in the manner, say, of Hannah Arendt's remarkable discussion of death camps and the origins of totalitarianism, which she designated as the location where persons become superfluous. By announcing the state of exception to be the dominant paradigm of government in contemporary politics, Agamben eliminated dividing lines between citizens and outsiders, between the liberal and the illiberal, between the democratic and the authoritarian, between the arbitrary and systematic lawfulness, precisely the borders. Each one of these lines is a border we need to guard. Should Agamben be right, liberal democracy has become entirely nugatory, a trifling form without meaningful substance. Even as it urgently captured the worst of reality and possibility, his jarring analysis, a form of critical poetry, cannot stand up to scrutiny, I think, because it's a, it's a diatribe that suffocates distinctions. Moving from imprisoning implications to fantasy solutions, state of exception erases any boundary between the ordinary and the exceptional something Dahl rightly refused to do. If Agamben eliminated prospects for liberal democracy by rhetorical fiat, Dahl's more nuanced and precise formulation in its own way was more challenging. Unlike Agamben, he insisted that we must ask hard questions inside history and within liberal democracy about the relationship between the normal and the exceptional. As I observed yesterday, Locke was among the first to identify emergencies and exceptions as fundamental challenges for liberal regimes. Ever since, these problems have been present inside liberal thought. Thus, with Dahl, we might explore whether this stock of ideas still offers resources, notwithstanding radically altered conditions, resources to help us navigate the rule of law. Might it be possible to limit yet permit a necessary zone of exception without overwhelming liberal democracy's most cherished qualities?
Can we confine the scope of security and tame Dahl's nightmare without descending to Agamben's? The stakes are high. In the language of Arendt, do we have nothing to fall back on in order to understand the phenomenon that confronts us with its overpowering reality and breaks down all the standards we know, end quote? Regarding death camps, perhaps not. Regarding exigencies, emergencies, and exceptions, I believe we do and we must, for otherwise, for otherwise liberal democracy has no future. While we continue to learn from the puzzles posed and the solutions offered by previous generations of liberal thinkers, today's challenges to liberal constitutionalism cannot simply be resolved by pointing to, let alone imitating, prior answers. We need fresh thought and policy prescriptions to discern how, indeed if, it might still be possible, as our colleague Bruce Ackerman has proposed, to design arrangements that allow, and I quote, short-term emergency measures, but draws the line against permanent restrictions. Is that likely in an age of enduring exceptions? If not, and I think probably not, what might be done? This question is trying. Which ideas and practices, that is, which rules, might best deploy constitutionalism, law, mechanisms of accountability, and such values as due process to serve security without undermining fundamental liberal norms or inhibiting means of learning and correction? Can coordination and remedies be achieved effectively without departing from liberal democracy's insistence that rulers give reasons, that decisions be as transparent as possible, and that judgments be rendered as to whether the public good has been indeed is being served. Is it possible to appraise the process of making choices and look back to inquire if decisions were made consistent with public liberties and that conferred on citizens the capacity to examine and critique their own leaders? More precisely, how might the combination of elements that discussed yesterday that Algernon Sidney had uh, put on the table in 1680, uh, things that he thought to be essential. He, remember his criteria were limited in time, circumscribed by law, and kept perpetually under the supreme authority of the people. How might the combination of those elements, the limited in time, circumscribed by law, and kept perpetually under the supreme authority of the people, can they be renewed? And with these criteria, how, as Sidney underscored, should the enabling ethical conditions that guard these institutional features be renewed in order to prevent a liberal order from changing character to slide on a moral slippery slope? Last evening, I noted that the quest for standards to navigate this problem has a long-standing lineage, as I said a moment ago, again, repeating myself. Searching for resources with which to undertake tasks of realism, repair, and fortification, we might specify how, despite present disorders, it still might be possible to adapt and deploy at least some of the resources offered by John Locke and Alexander Hamilton and Abraham Lincoln as they replied to Hobbes and those developed by Friedrich, Carl Friedrich and Frederick Watkins and Clinton Rossiter as they responded to Carl Schmitt. Perhaps as a first step by revisiting those efforts to answer Hobbes and Schmitt and by applying them to the conditions for institutional arrangements designated by Algernon Sidney we can establish persuasive principles to guide more particular institutional recommendations. At stake is the ability to hold fast to a distinction already familiar to the founders, the difference between the flexible and the arbitrary. Flexibility, Dahl argued in his Abrams lectures, requires that citizens possess three capacities – 
competence, what he called competence, control, and influence. Competence, he argued, is the moral and instrumental ability to make adequately enlightened judgments either about policies or about the terms on which authority to make decisions may safely be delegated. Control demands that citizens should be able to ensure, and I quote Dahl, that the final decision corresponds with their informed intentions. And influence obliges those to whom authority is delegated to be motivated to seek the goals implied by the informed intentions of citizens, or the greater number of them, rather than merely their own interests or even their own private conceptions of the public good." End quote. To these ends, Dahl called for intensive public education and the formation of deliberative opportunities for representative groups of citizens who had gained high competence and thus could stand for and represent others. This is a very Yale uh, a way of thinking if you think of Jim Fishkin's work, for example. Uh, these steps would address the criterion Sidney designated as, quote, kept perpetually under the supreme authority of the people. But from the vantage of enduring exceptions, this orientation of dolls still left open the two other criteria, limited in time and circumscribed by law. To generate answers with respect to all of Sidney's stipulations, I sought assistance in previous lectures from within the range of liberal ideas dating from Locke. It will be recalled how Locke insisted that executive prerogative must not be arbitrary or boundless. Decisions taken through that time, type of power only prevail until the legislature can convene and judge. Legitimation depends on norms and popular judgment about the public good. Popular sovereignty is intended not only to empower but to limit action in a good regime. Informed and vigilant citizens are the ultimate judges for Locke, reserving the right to rebel when a ruler utilizes prerogative power to abuse, not advance, the public good. The founders, it will be remembered, likewise insisted on safeguards. These included the two-year limit on congressional appropriations for the military, the centrality of legislative consent, the existence of checks by the federal judiciary, a commitment to federalism notwithstanding its inherent ambiguities regarding states' rights, and the robust adversarial spirit of party and public debate underpinned by shared values committed to liberty. Lincoln, we know, acted not just to protect but to achieve the core principles of the Declaration and the Constitution. He refused to suspend elections or curb the press or limit public debate about the war and emancipation. On his watch, Congress acted energetically without executive interference to investigate and oversee. Emergency powers thus did not erase but advanced the deeply political aspects of an open liberal democracy marked by separation of powers, even when it was placed under ultimate pressure. Further, the 20th century American critics of Schmidt, including Watkins and Rossiter and Friedrich, required that there be no departure from the rule of law, that exceptions must be specific and targeted, thus controlled in scope as well as limited in time. They relied on public virtue, representative institutions, and an active public sphere. In dramatic contrast to Agamben and Schmidt, the constellation of liberal thinkers also insisted, and this point is crucial, that it is a mistake to accept too radical a separation between the domain of exceptions and the larger regime within which this zone is embedded and between a pre-existing community and a legally constituted political community. It is the latter, a political community, not a pre-political constellation, which under duress possesses the right to rebel. These points were underscored by President Lincoln's advisor, 
the German emigre Francis Lieber. In a recently rediscovered manuscript on martial law, written during the three decades after the Civil War and completed by his son, Nathan. Lieber is best known for the code he drafted to direct how Union soldiers should conduct themselves with regard to such matters as the expropriation of property, deserters, spies, the exchange of prisoners, martial law. Five months from now, Yale University Press will be publishing this document with an introduction by its editors, Will Smiley and our John Witt, where they report how, for the Liebers, a state of emergency, and I quote, does not throw a constitutional regime back into the state of nature, certainly not when the regime is a complex constitutional democracy. The Liebers' crucial insight was that the moment of emergency poses a distinctive problem in collectivities that constitute themselves through law. Schmidt imagined that the emergency allowed the sovereign to reorganize a collectivity that already had identity independent of law. The paradigmatic case for Schmidt was the ethic, ethnically, ethnically homogeneous community. But in legally constituted communities, there is no collective entity existing prior to the laws to be saved by transforming the law. Law makes the community, so there is nothing for the sovereign to rescue other than that which the law has made. The manuscript by the Liebers also teaches a second lesson, equally important, that places us on Dahl's rather than Agamben's terrain. As Smiley and Witt observe, unlike Agamben, as well as Schmidt, the Liebers stressed that the moment of exception cannot escape the assumptions, cultural codes, and folkways of the regime. Foundational features of the regime inevitably shape the projects, interests, and identity of those who seize authority in the emergency. The basic values of a community's law thus travel into the very depths of a crisis. Indeed, they do so inevitably. Thus, they note, Quote, Agamben's notion of a moment of bare and unmediated power simply does not come into being, end quote. Yet, alas, it might. What may well come into being, after continuous and normalized exceptions, is that the preferences of the people and the character of the regime might change so fundamentally that, as in Rome, a former republic, may morph into empire, or commissarial initiatives may transform into solutions outside the constitutional order. Collectively, the various rejoinders to Hobbes and Schmidt, and implicitly to Agamben, from Locke through Lieber and on to Rossiter, insisted that the rule of law both shapes the community and, when thickly in place, sets limits on what can be done in a liberal democracy to confront pressing exigencies. Dahl, you, you will recall, did not only convey deep anxiety, excuse me, it's water time. Excellent. Um, Dahl, you will recall, did not only convey deep anxiety about a zone of exception aside normal democratic processes in his 1953 article on atomic energy, he also noted approvingly, quote, that the arrival of nuclear weapons had not assuredly pushed us to the edge of dictatorship. And he perceived how America's leaders, quote, are quite patently not imposing a tyrannical will on a terrified public. Whether and how limits and constraints a vibrant liberal democracy imposes matter quite a lot then. So the patrimony of liberal thought is invaluable, teaching that there is no other basis for exceptions but responsibility for liberty, and that there must be no departure from the rule of law, our ultimate guarantee against the great nightmare of sovereign dictatorship. Yet the worrying features of our contemporary situation 
make it difficult to confidently announce that the orientations proposed by liberals from Locke forward can either be easily or effectively guide our present policies, politics, and actions. The altered conditions, Dahl underscored, require more than 18th and 19th century models of prerogative and more than 20th century models of constitutional dictatorship based on the Roman model, more than they can provide, each in its own way uh, premised on the assumption of a temporal arc that no longer exists. The trio of Hobbes, Schmidt, and Agamben haunts our vulnerability. Responses and liberal answers have become more pressing and more difficult at a time of multiple bases of insecurity, including terror, cyber, and the enduring threat of nuclear exchange. Ever since Dahl's initial writing on atomic power, the sense of emergency has become more open-ended. Implied powers have developed in tandem with ever more express exceptions and there are scant requisite procedures to place restrictions on presidents who wish to act as if they are sovereign dictators. Power has been increasingly centralized. The legislature often abdicates, delegates, or is ignored. The number of decision makers has been reduced. Secrecy often reigns. Judicial review is limited. Surveillance mechanisms grow and citizens grow either docile and unsettled or positively acclaim some of these developments. In the inverse of liberal norms, citizens become more visible, the state less so. The status of private life and autonomous citizenry has become muddled. Never before has a zone of exceptions developed cumulatively over an extended period inside liberal democracy, a site designated not just by anti-liberals like Agamben, but by passionate liberals like Dahl, Eisenhower, Obama. And never before have these arrangements seemed so foreboding and menacing to liberal democracy itself. The zone of exceptions is also charged with irony. As an example, the authorization for use of military force that Congress passed three days after 9-11 and which Presidents Bush and Trump have interpreted expansively as authorizing a continuing and open-ended delegation to the President to combat insecurity by any necessary means was read more narrowly by President Obama. As we have seen, he preferred to rely on, in the fight against terror on constitutional Article II powers inherent in the presidency. But one result of his tighter reading, almost certainly without intention, has been to distance Congress even further from executive decision and to elide the process of political representation. Yet the shift to a universe of national security marked by durable and lasting exceptions possesses some potential advantages. As pressures of necessity extend, the insulation of decision makers presents opportunities to coordinate and deliberate over a more protracted period, with chances to consider, to offer reasons, to guide public debate, and retrospectively evaluate and learn. Vengeance may yield to reason, regarding how to navigate the continuum from risk to deep uncertainty. There may be times, as both Locke and Hamilton insisted, when necessity trumps law, but as they also insisted, such circumstances must be constrained by prudence, by institutional arrangements, by active regulation, and the goal of serving and advancing the public good. We can see such considerations at work in some of the best post-9-11 treatments of emergency powers. Think of the significant writings many of you will know of David Diesenhaus or Nomi Lazar, who earned her degree here as examples, and in the policy imagination of those like Bruce Ackerman, who have been considering what to do when leaders must react to violent and intensely dangerous developments not foreseen that demand 
urgent response. As his writing reminds us, debate generated by audacious designs is valuable, not least for the invitation to debate both practical and constitutional issues. What we presently lack, however, are prescriptions that fully take current conditions into account and respond to Agamben's critique the way our predecessors responded to Hobbes and Schmidt. Rather, rather than erase the prospects for liberal democracy, as Agamben directs, we must navigate, we're challenged to navigate, the space that both separates and connects the arena of exceptions to more ordinary liberal democratic sites. Machiavelli famously thought that provisions for crises must be placed wholly inside constitutional procedures. In a republic, it is not good for anything to happen, he wrote, which requires governing by extraordinary measures. The American approach, by contrast, has been different. Though the Constitution was born in crisis, apart from the suspension of habeas corpus during an invasion or internal rebellion, that document is either silent or implicit regarding emergencies and exceptions. Like Locke's second treatise, it placed prerogative power outside formal and constitutional stipulation, but relies on the president's implied and stipulated powers. How, we thus have to ask, should content and barriers be identified at just that location? Manifestly, there's need for sober reason. To this end, I'll close with some preliminary, very preliminary, thoughts which I first want to pose as questions and then make some suggestions. First, is it possible to re-describe key aspects of reality without falsehood in order to sustain, indeed reinvigorate, the distinction that was so central to the Roman model, separating temporary action from permanent policy. Which arrangements might propose this useful fiction separating the temporary from the permanent? Second, is it possible to discern and develop widely shared prudential standards, including definitions of necessity, in advance in order to, be, to legitimately anticipate and respond to security emergencies. With what content, what breath, breath with a D, what bite? Third, how should the core institutions of liberal democracy, especially the legislature, be mobilized to better conduct tasks of instruction to the executive and oversight of its action? What instruments do parliaments, including Congress, possess or could come to possess to advance that prospect? And fourth, perhaps most important, can we create opportunities for retrospective judgment and appraisal in order to modify, shape, and constrain the zone of exception? If liberal democracy thrives as an instrument for provisional policy judgments, how can procedures for learning be institutionalized? And what and might just such mechanisms strengthen a widely shared liberal political culture without which they might not be of much use? So let me speak to each of these four sets of questions in turn before I conclude. Persisting threats notwithstanding, leaders can act, I believe must act, as if the division between permanent and temporary interventions remains actively functional. One way to achieve that goal is by requiring legislative, relevant legislative acts and delegations to be fixed in time, always subject to formal renewal. Such a requirement, stressed by Hamilton, is hardwired in the Constitution to the effect that military expenditures cannot be authorized and appropriated for periods longer than two years. Only when, in this manner, legislation characterized by significant delegation contains provisions for sunset 
can consequential debates about the degree of necessity and the scope of exception be conducted among political elites and more broadly in the press, the media, and by the public within civil society. Further, as Francis Lieber argued, emergency actions by the government should be appraised by what his rediscovered manuscript calls a reasonable citizen standard based on the imagined judgment of persons who are, quote, moderate and reasonable. This is a standard asking whether measures to deal with exigencies are proportionate to the actual threat. Quote, when reason and common sense do not approve the particular act, this is a quote from Lieber, the act becomes unlawful with all the consequences attending to illegality, end quote. Witt comments, John Witt comments, that, quote, the reasonable person thus turned the moment of necessity into a moment in which the ends and means to be adopted by the state were continually constituted and reconstituted. Necessity in Lieber's hands was not merely a warrant for harsh measures, though it could sometimes be that. It was instead a discursive frame for means, ends, reflective equilibria, a way of organizing and restructuring the process by which we decide who we are in the midst of an emergency. Politics of exception must not portend invisibility or isolation from democratic practices. To the contrary, each branch of government, especially the legislature, but also the judiciary, and agencies within the executive branch itself must possess opportunities for information sharing, judgment, and supervision in real time. Contemporaneous oversight in the tradition of the separation of powers, we must recall, lies at the heart of America's constitutional design for government, a government meant not to be predatory. Here, the role of Congress is crucial. We badly need assessments from students of Congress, not least the most distinguished of them, Professor Mayhew. We badly need assessments of such students of Congress, together with members and their staffs, about how to change the incentive structure that presently makes congressional representatives reluctant to restrain, decide, and oversee with respect to national security. And what happens after the fact? Is there room for post hoc appraisal? This question calls for systematic reconnaissance. Perhaps the most feasible and most important of all potential steps, post-emergency learning and evaluation tied to sanctions when liberal norms have been violated might help confine the scope of exceptions to that of necessity as defined by democratic reason and robust representation. Consider specific examples of retrospective evaluation drawn from Great Britain's institutional complex. Unlike the United States, there exist British institutions that demonstrate significant retroactive and reflective possibilities. None navigates the terrain perfectly, but they possess far more fluidity and creativity than the arrangements currently available here in the United States. The most traditional of these institutions, quite similar in many ways to constitutional committees on intelligence, is Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee. Like its American counterparts, the ISC questions security and intelligence analysts in private, tends to defer to government, identifies closely with the security agencies, and issues only heavily redacted public reports. Notwithstanding, on occasion, it far more audaciously questions heads of the security services in public. It has defended privacy concerns regarding bulk surveillance and has reported to the public on the country's drone strikes. More than the United States, Britain possesses a significant tradition of public reports and large-scale inquiries in matters of national security. 2006, for an as an example, witnessed the publication by the Cabinet Office of, quote, 
the national security strategy of the United Kingdom, guided, it said, and grounded in a set of core values. I quote, they include human rights, the rule of law, legitimate and accountable government, justice, freedom, tolerance, and opportunity. While considering instrumental means, many at the edge of these values to keep the country safe. Though such a document did not solve the relationship between the two, it was able to generate discussion about how to chart a course um, after the Iraq War. More autonomous from sitting governments is the tradition of independent inquiries, dating from the Tribunal of Inquiry Act of 1921, that began modestly with the investigation of particular police constables. The range over time has been broad, including river safety, health emergencies, and national security. In 2004, a review was conducted regarding intelligence on weapons of mass destruction and why things went wrong in Iraq, a report that found major flaws. The most recent example of such a report is the 12-volume, 2.6 million word Iraq inquiry led by Sir John Chilcott, published in 2016, uh, with an in inexpensive 225-page executive summary. Um, a summary that our sitting president probably would not read. Um, this 2016 report conveyed to the public the stinging results of an extraordinarily thorough investigation that lasted seven years, arguing that the case for war and the legal basis had been deficient, preparation was inadequate, the results a failure. Press coverage was extensive. For weeks, it was the prevalent story. Now, more original and demanding, so more original and demanding particularly close study and potential emulation is what I believe to be a globally unique institution, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, a 10-member body that has been in existence since 2000 created by the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. Complaints can be made to the tribunal by members of the public and NGOs about interception and surveillance by the police or other public authorities, or about the conduct by the security agencies thought to be outside the law. Particularly in cases brought by NGOs, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal's just retired president, Sir Michael Burton, has written, it has now become the practice of the tribunal to hold open hearings with full open argument, with eminent counsel, expert in human rights appearing before us. We are no longer described as Britain's most secret court. We have developed this procedure in national security cases of assuming the facts in favor of the claimant, a claimant, including an NGO, is entitled to bring a claim without proof of what is alleged, simply on the basis of reasonable suspicion. And the facts are assumed in his favor, and the tribunal then considers whether on those assumptions the conduct complained of is lawful. After open hearings, the tribunal reports its decision in an open judgment, and the legal conclusion can then be applied to the actual facts. This, Burton continued, and I quote, gives us considerable advantage over the statutory commissioners and the parliamentary committees because we can hear adversarial argument, balancing the public need for security against the need for public scrutiny, the interests of privacy and free speech, end quote. There have been quite dramatic outcomes, leading to rebukes of the government and to public disclosure of much that was previously closed, particularly the rules and procedures under which the agencies operated. Without, the IPT and the government believe, sacrifices to national security. The closest American analog, perhaps, is the FISA court, but its circumspection and limitations, including its secrecy, are legion. Navigating tensions between security and freedom is a process, not a matter that can be decisively resolved. 
There is no single or portable solution to governing emergency in a liberal frame. Instituting similar procedures in the United States or any other liberal polity would pose distinct legal and political challenges. Likewise, policy responses to present conditions will be variously inflected by expectations, values, and dispositions about the order of political priorities. I should like to offer the last word to Yale's Frederick Watkins, Robert Dahl's senior colleague, and from whom he always said he learned a great deal. Writing in 1939, Watkins observed that ever since ancient Rome's most consti sorry, that ever since ancient Rome, most constitutional states have, quote, considered it wise to provide some regular means for the suspension of normal political procedures in the face of temporary crises. Despite this timeless reality, he continued, quote, there seldom has been a time when emergency institutions loom so large as they do today in the realm of actual practice. 1939. He noted as a student of the Third Reich that when regimes claim absolute power, they have no need to appeal for social and representative approbation. He further took note of the fragility of liberal alternatives. Quote, the spectacular doings of Hitler and his associates, he wrote, should not be allowed to make us forget that this, Germany, was a country once reckoned as one of the more important seats of modern constitutionalism. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, one of the more important seats of modern constitutionalism, with a government that in the 1920s had conducted many experiments, a good many successful, with emergency powers. At the start of World War II, Watkins concluded that there exists a deep need in liberal political orders not to abjure necessary means to confront the enemies of liberal democracy, but for liberal democracies to identify, and I quote, effective safeguards against the abuse of emergency powers. What he could not have known was how matters that loomed so large in 1939 soon would take the more enduring form that Dahl would identify a decade and a half later. Today, we know yet more as citizens who face a range of exigencies in an age of terrible weapons and networks of terror that mutate but endure. As we try to chart a decent course, we would do worse than consider as our lodestar the imperatives announced by Algernon Sidney's 1680 Discourses Concerning Government, limited in time, circumscribed by law, and kept perpetually under the supreme authority of the people. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, sure, we're going to have questions. And we have a mic back there, do we not? Yeah, so talk something about the. Wait for the, uh, oh, so the mic. Talk something about the difference between the atomic age, you know, which is so impersonal in a sense. I mean, it's threatening, but it's this great big thing that could happen, uh, versus the current period, which is more decentralized, uh, uh, diffuse, uh, ter dealing with terrorism and small wars and all uh, upsets of different kinds, but they don't have that sort of central centralizing yeah. aspect to it. So, great question. It, it's, a, it's actually a flaw of, um, of my three days of remarks um, that I haven't made that distinction. Um, uh, there's a way in which the distinction is very important and there's a way in which it's not important. I'll start with the not important. The, the, the not important, it seems to me, is that the way in which the national government, the national state, 
responded to um, the atomic uh, situation, starting e even when the United States possessed a monopoly, um, and especially after 1949, um, when the monopoly ended and the Cold War was raging. It wasn't so cold after Korea. Um, uh, and when the use, it should be said, we now know from reading, myself have read, um, many once uh, classified National Security Council papers, when the use of those weapons was actively being considered again and again, um, the, um, the march to a zone of exceptions um, was one that Dahl wrote about in 1953. His essay was only about atomic weapons. Um, but he announced the worry that this zone might expand. And where, there's, where the distinction um, doesn't produce a difference um, is that the ways in which we have responded to, let's call it the, quote, war on terror situation, um, without commenting on whether that's the right language or not, but to the diffuseness, the number of non-state actors, the, the unpredictability, the personal sense of it. Not that many people get killed by terrorists compared to other ways of being killed, but it feels very personally threatening in a way that atomic warfare doesn't quite, though it should. Um, uh, and the, um, but the response to that has been much the same. That is to create a growing zone of um, of exceptions um, outside what Dahl called the ordinary processes of democracy. And this extends not only, has extended not only through congressional delegation and, and uh, legislative action, it's extended to creating autonomous zones of bureaucrats, um, those who listen to phone calls or those who worry about the mail or, um, and so on and so forth, who have been uh, rather for most of the period, uh, been, been rather unconstrained. So the, the, this expanded zone of exceptions has existed, and it's expanded both under the atomic impulse and, let's call it the terror um, uh, Im impulse. Um, and of course, the atomic impulse has not gone away. Uh, it's not as if we've solved that problem and have just moved on to the next. But I think the distinction matters quite a lot um, because uh, it, it, it matters in at least um, the following number of ways. I'm now thinking out loud. Um, uh, first, it matters for how, for the nature of the relationship between leaders and citizens and how um, anxiety is mobilized or can be mobilized, how fear can be created and mobilized, um, or more responsibly, how fear can be dampened and turned to more ordinary levels of anxiety. Um, some of you know one of my favorite distinctions was made by the economist Frank Knight all the way back in 1921 um, uh, in a book on, called Risk and Uncertainty and Profit, where he distinguished between ordinary risk and deep uncertainty. And ordinary risk is, um, is calculable. Um, uh, because it's risk within a set of fixed parameters. The atomic Cold War moment with deterrence theory and the, le and, and the like seemed like that to the Henry Kissingers of the world, let's just say. Um, but then there's um, circumstances that generate deep anxiety and even fear, uh, which occur because we, we, we think we've lost control of the parameters. And ironically, even though atomic warfare is far more potentially threatening uh, to all of us, certainly to the planet as a whole, than um, the levels of terror which we've um, witnessed, um, the more personal qualities um, have led more people to think we don't control the parameters and therefore we're more fearful, disproportionate to the actual threat. So that's an important um, uh, difference. Um, and then finally, I think a uh, second important difference is that we, um, in a way, it's easier, though I, I put a 
put a question mark after my, each of my declarative sentences. It's, it's easier to um, take the way in which atomic weapons have been managed and put them, as Dahl thought they were being, in a separate zone, necessary but also isolated from um, the ordinary processes of, of, of democratic life, thus leaving them more or less intact. So Dahl could write his little essay on atomic uh, danger and write a preface to democratic theory at exactly the same time without referring back and forth uh, because they were separate zones. Whereas it's possible that the, the terror um, uh, 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 circumstance um, creates aspects of exception both in rhetoric and in policy that become more constitutive of everyday processes. Um, and in that sense, potentially more insidious to liberal democracy. So thanks. Uh, wait, wait for the mic. Oh, yes, the mic. Bring the mic up. So uh, you pointed to this difference between Britain and the U.S. That's been there for quite a long time, but from the 1920s through the Chilcot Report as a better system of institutional management. And I was just wondering if you had anything to say about why, why do you think uh, Britain has managed to uh, produce these kinds of policing institutions that are more effective than the ones we have? Um, yet another good and challenging question. I'm, uh, let me modify the premise of the question. Although the um, uh, the tradition of uh, open and public retrospective reports dates from the 1921 Act. Um, for the first few decades, um, it didn't deal with the kinds of issues. You know, they really, people made complaints about how constables in Liverpool were policing uh, the port um, at night and there'd be a, a parliamentary uh, sanctioned independent investigation. But um, it's really since uh, 2001 and since Iraq that you really see the ratcheting up, I think, of that um, public inquiry tradition, though uh, it, I'm on very thin ice here um, uh, in terms of getting the history right. Um, but that is for, for the period between, say, the mid-1930s to, to our century. I, I just don't know enough. Um, but the, I think in Britain, where you see seen an escalation of this, was the profound recoil against um, what seemed like a manifest uh, caving or subordination to the Bush administration decisions about Iraq. And that led to sufficient public outrage and parliamentary outrage um, that the existing tools um, including the independent uh, kind of report that Chilcot produced, two million words and so on, <clears throat> was activated. Um, so I think it was a combination of situation, um, the nature of alliance, um, and uh, the recoil of both, um, and both parties um, uh, in parliament and uh, three parties, if you like, in parliament and in the public that um, gave that oomph, but the, but the structure already existed. The other thing that's new, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal only dates from this century, and it has only really come into, um, as far as I can tell, full life. Um, uh, I've now read most of its decisions over a, a, a period, um, uh, certainly since the Iraq War, but even, even more recently. And, and mostly to deal with the sense that the way in which um, MI5 and MI6 have dealt with the terror situation has often exceeded um, uh, proper rule of law. And I should add one thing and, uh, to how they work, which interests me a lot. So um, imagine you believe, as the head of an NGO, that um, you've been, your phones have been tapped, your mail's been listened to, you've been chased around inappropriately. Um, you bring a complaint. The first question the Investigatory Powers Tribunal asks is not whether, you, as I said, not whether 
the facts back you up. Let's assume you're right. First question, is there any warrant for this behavior in an act of parliament? So are they just freewheeling, or is it grounded in, in the ordinary rules of the game of parliamentary sovereignty? If the answer is no, that is, there is no warrant, they issue a public rebuke, and the persons who bring the complaint get substantial damages, and it's a public rebuke. The, the, the second step is, let's assume there is parliamentary warrant. And most, they have legislation like the Patriot Act and so on, which um, gives a lot of space. Second question, um, if, uh, if there is a warrant, did the institution, say MI5 or something, did it follow that law by elaborating a set of regulations more detailed than the law which are consistent with the intent of the law. And if, if the sense is no, they didn't, there was a kind of runaway agent. They took the, you know, Carl Schmitt says, or Agam Ben say, it's just a hollow law, it, it's, a, it's a cover, um, it's a phony law. Well, if they find that the agency acted as if it's a phony law, they issue a public rebuke, and, they, and damages. Third step, okay, there are such regulations. Did the agency act according to its own regulations in pursuing this instance? Doesn't always follow. You could have them, but not act on them. Did they exceed their regulatory authority? Again, if the answer is they violated that, there's a public rebuke and damages. Um, there's a uh, the way in which they worked has actually changed the way in which bulk surveillance occurs in Great Britain. Um, they also ruled on, um, this may become obsolete soon, on the relationship of how uh, Britain works in this security area and how European courts, uh, the European justice system, insists you operate and so on and so forth. But rule of law really matters here um, and it's reinforced in a way that has a public learning quality. Um, and um, as far as I know, there have been no judgments made that have been resisted um, or treated as illegitimate or as, if you like, fake news by those in power of, of either party, um, even as they've been very unpleasant for some of the time for them. Um, so uh, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a new process. It doesn't date forever. Um, and. Um, Full disclosure, um, the, the person I quoted, Sir Michael Burton, who was a high court judge, uh, now retired, the head of this institution is my son's father-in-law. So <laughs> and hence, I, so I may have been captured by this uh, source, but, but, um, uh, but thanks to him, I, 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 I've you know, had access to um, lots of interesting documentation. And I've I've actually been impressed by the way in which these, this, this uh, uh, tribunal of 10, all, all actual or former or current high court judges, um, conduct themselves. And I simply observe, I, I, maybe I'm missing something, but I can't think of any equivalent institution um, we have presently in the United States. Is that, would that be right, Susan? Yeah, good. Doug Ray? Yes. Hi, Doug. I keep wondering to myself where uh, the demos uh, has any business in decisions about the use of military weapons. Uh, imagine a, a demagogic um, leader and a, an inflamed public anxious to set right some dreadful evil in the world. Uh, with the use of ultimate, ultimate power. Uh, I would be inclined to resist the idea that 90% support for doing that would count as any, any part of a reason for actually letting it happen. And I'm wondering where that, that question would be for you. That's a that's not just a good question, that's a really hard question. Um, the, 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 the best of the Yale tradition. Um, 
I'm not, let me be clear, I'm not arguing that issues of security, war and peace, uh, uh, danger are up for, you know, Brexit-like referenda, that let's go to the people all the time and ask, because whether or not you have demagogic leaders that would open up to, to demagogy, um, uh, you know, you don't make public policy about most things, but certainly not fateful security decisions simply by, um, in effect, the kind of public opinion poll, right? Um, having said that, I still would stand by the, to quote again from um, Algin on Sydney, the ultimately, under the supreme authority of the people, and the supreme authority of people is not necessarily the same as public opinion polling or referenda. Uh, it, it's more in the spirit of a lock on prerogative power who says, yes, the executive must act independently under conditions of exigency, but the people retrospectively have a right to judge whether that action was carried out in the, under, for the public good. And um, that is a retrospective judgment taken in cooler times, not in the heat of the emergency. Um, so uh, a, a retrospective look at whether it was a retrospective look at American participation in World War I or a retrospective look on um, the Iraq War, um, seems to me that, that has potentially real meaning, but also provided the three criteria that Dahl in his 1984 lectures uh, underscored uh, in terms of how to make for a more informed citizenry. So there are conditions of rationality, information, and um, temporality that it seems to me would um, condition the, uh, the role the people would play, um, not a role that of, you know, passion under duress which says go get them no matter, no matter what. Um, So all of the things you've mentioned today, and, the, and they're very interesting, and I, I'm going to think through um, the institutional balances between yeah, actually, them. But maybe better to do it without yeah, them. I know yeah. I was going to say. Um, but the question I had was something you mentioned yesterday, too, is that behind whether these institutions work partially depends also on existing popular norms and intuitions. And I guess, and, and especially, as you say, the two sites that seem to not work as um, checks on, ex on the expansion of executive power is a congressional delegation. And I guess the question is, Pop, where's the people there? Because one of the things you mentioned over the last few days is that the moment of counter, the, the, the 70s or the few moments where there was a counter movement, it was driven by popular yes. outrage and some form of popular protest. And so I guess the one question is, where, where do you think, well, are we in a moment in where there is any popular outrage, and if there isn't, why isn't there? Because I do think it kind of gets to this other question of, you know, you also said that part of the reason, and I, I have to go back to read the, the Rossiter and the Watkins, like why the, those uh, ideas of constitutional dictatorship may not apply or the solutions they uh, suggested because we live in a time of more enduring exception, or at least a time of, of perception mm -hmm. of enduring exception. So, and especially in America, so this of course is the irony, it's probably the, as you say, you've said a few times, it's the least, it's one of the least likely places to suffer from terrorist attacks around the world, and the West in general is least likely at any average citizen. So is it, do citizens actually fear, I mean, are they actually experiencing more insecurity, actually, or is there, you know, where's the psychology of fear that's allowing the claims of an enduring exception? And, I guess part of that is getting back to whether you really think our contemporary situation is so distinct from the 50s or from, you know, the invention of bombs in the in the, at the turn of the 19th century that that the cons, you know that the the actual checks have to be very different, or is it more is it something specific about a, a psychological sense of insecurity that may be new, but and needs to also be 
you know, maybe we do need these public discussions to have a real um, engaged and informed public debate about about this. But I'm just curious, wh wh where do you think the people the yeah. people are on this question? Well, there's, a, there's a lot there in what you're um, asking. I want to start with the um, temporal question because there's a counter argument which I've to, to the whole structure of my talk, which uh, you hinted at, um, which I'm trying to think through, um, at least until this moment, privately think it through, but now I'll... Uh, there have been moments, uh, for example, the, um, the, f the first appearance of the airplane with a bomb, um, making civilians vulnerable in a way that was completely unprecedented, um, occurs in the First War. Um, uh, or the incredible intensification of artillery that occurs prior to that. Um, one can go through moments of stepwise changes in, um, in the technology of violence. Um, but on that score, the stepwise change to atomic and nuclear weapons, um, and this was Dahl's insight, and I think it's right, was so qualitatively different um, as to make it not impossible, but much less possible to treat uh, security situations in the model of the Roman dictatorship as temporary, because that was not going away. Now, of course, airplanes weren't going away, and tanks weren't going away, and machine guns weren't going away, but the episodes of use could be contained, and the even the terrible outcome of use, even as bad as the first war, um, could be said to have stopped and people could talk the language of a return to normalcy. And he made the argument there's no return to normalcy. Um, and I think that's right. Now what's interesting, and is a puzzle I don't understand, is if, uh, I did research, some of you know, and wrote about the period that included the Truman years, and in that period, um, uh, atomic fear in the mass public was palpable. Um, Life magazine ran a series of articles, as I mentioned the other day, I think, of uh, missiles before there were such missiles uh, hitting New York City. And the only thing left standing were the two lions in front of the public library. Um, the, uh, 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 when uh, uh, John Hersey wrote um, Hiroshima, it was broadcast for seven nights running on ABC radio, prime time. Um, that kind of um, discourse about atomic fear has more or less disappeared in this country. Uh, we don't talk about it. We talk about the war on terror, or possibly. Um, so there's a real puzzle there about what happened to that um, uh, dimension of fear. But I think part of the answer about where we are now and why there isn't either outrage or movement or concern or pushback of the kind that we had um, in the 70s, I think has two reasons. And once again, I'm playing with uh, things I haven't thought through. Um, first, um, the 19, in the 19, really the, the pushback comes before 1976. It already starts with the War, War Powers Act of 1973 and hearings before that. It's Vietnam War which for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Americans was a war of personal vulnerability. And even for those of us who got deferments, it was a personal vulnerability. Um, the, the war on terror doesn't generate anything like that for, um, uh, in a direct way over many years um, and so on. So back to Susan's question about um, you know, what's personal and what's not. Vietnam was both impersonal and personal um, uh, all at once, and it generated a movement, um, and it generated a movement that had electoral consequences as well as the end of the Johnson presidency, among other things. So uh, that, that force um, uh, doesn't uh, I I I exist. And so that's one uh, critical um, difference. And, um, Second, I, I, I think that um, uh, the 9-11 shock, 
you no, know, yes, 3,000 people or so killed as opposed to blah, blah, blah. But the idea in a media age, you could watch over and over those planes flying into the iconic World Trade Center, uh, people jumping out, you know, uh, et cetera. Uh, I, I actually think that in, has endured as, a, as an image well beyond Oklahoma City or other domestic or kids being killed in classrooms and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and it was um, uh, conveyed a sense of vulnerability because unlike the atomic age of the Cold War, as I said before, the parameters of risk don't seem, didn't seem controllable. Who the hell, how did they get there? And, and in airplanes, smashing the World Trade Center, it just seemed so inconceivable um, that it, it transcends the objective numbers or probabilities in, in, in some ways. And that has given warrant um, not just to, say, Bush um, unitary executive views and so on, but gave warrant to Obama to go after an American citizen without, kill him without trial in Yemen. Um, uh, this was another big extension of, uh, uh, you know, the, the meaning of uh, rule of law and citizenship. And without any pushback, perhaps some might argue, maybe I would argue if I thought, if I knew more, that it was not even a stupid thing to do. But the, uh, but the steps that have been taken, and further, last thing I would say, I'm sorry to go on so long, seems to me that the, the changes we're witnessing here are kind of salami-like slices. Um, if you add up, there have been, I don't know, tens of um, executive orders of various kinds, and well over 10 major congressional pieces of legislation since 9-11 um, on these subjects. And each one you know, accumulates without the whole ever being held up to view as the central problem for liberal democracy. Renita oh. Folson, is there any question from somebody who is not a faculty member? I've been attentive to faculty ah. members. Go ahead, yes. The exceptions are defined by the rules or the laws, but what defines the emergencies? Anybody, uh, ah, a minister, a president can decide well, on any occasion that it's an emergency? No, that's a great, great question. And now, the. Everybody hear the question, who decides that it's an emergency? Well, let's distinguish first, something objective happens, imagine. I mean, that is, either there's pure fiction or something occurs, but then it has to be interpreted. And it's in the interpretation that it becomes an emergency, okay? Um, typically, uh, in, in a liberal democracy, elected officials interpret, and they've been, in effect, delegated by the public through election as people to be trusted. Now, really interesting that in the Roman model of dictatorship that I've spoken about, the dictator was not the per the dictator who could serve only for six months and only for the emergency, was not a person who was eligible to declare that it was an emergency. But we have a consequence. Our president can declare that it's an emergency and then becomes, in effect, the, quote, dictator for that period, for that function. So we've, we're less well off in terms of um, being able to guard this question of an excessive definition of emergency. Okay, so, um, <laughs>